Hi everyone and welcome to the last episode of this uh, tutorial series. In this episode we are going to go further on the file that we built in the episode number 3 and what we are going to be doing is we are going to look at how we can control not only the shape of the individual components in the aggregation but also how we can control the shape of the overall aggregation. And we are going to do that using two things. So we are going to use a field and if you don't know uh, what a field exactly is. We're going to see it briefly, but then I'm going to put some links to the field tutorials of the WASP 101 series. And we're going to use a field to control uh, the geometry of this to grow in a certain way within a given geometry. And then we're going to also use a mesh constraint to make sure that the growth of this one stays within the geometry and doesn't go outside. And lastly, what we're going to do also is we're going to take the same geometry and use this geometry as the attractor that will control the scaling of an individual part. So rather than having a separate point that control this, we're going to have the outer shell of the whole aggregation that will control whether a geometry becomes smaller or larger inside it. Let's get started. The first thing we want to do is we want to create a field which will represent the distance from the surface that we have here. And so very simply what a field is, is a grid of points in which each point store a certain value. And in the case of what we're doing now is we're going to store the value of the distance from the surface itself. So to do that, we're going to first of all import our surface. And we're going to do that creating a geometry component. We're going to right click, set one geometry and pick our weirdly shaped geometry here. I'm going to then also select it and in Rhino hide it. And what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to go to the WASP tab, which I need to find. Here we go. And in the WASP tab, I'm going to go into the aggregation tab and get the field points component. And so what this is going to do is it's going to get our geometry, create a bounding box around it, and then fill this bounding box with a grid of points. And so we're going to connect this here. And you'll see that automatically we'll create this grid of points. And it's going to tell us that the resolution by default has been set to 11 units. That it's kind of a very coarse resolution. So we want to make it a bit finer, we can have a bit of a higher resolution and I'm gonna for example put it to 5 and now you'll see that this will create a much finer um, grid of points. Now that we created this grid of points we can go on and compute the values that we want to store into this grid. So to do that we're gonna first of all do the same that we've been doing when we were using a point attractor so we're gonna use a pull point component to find the projection of each of these points on our base geometry. So we're going to plug our points to P and our geometry to G. And you'll see that this will result in all our points being projected onto our surface. We're then going to be, as we did before, remapping these values. So we're going to remap them and we're going to use again the bound component. And so if we leave it to default, we're going to have a very high value when we are far away from the surface and a very low value when we're close to the surface. And that's what we want because what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that all the points that are outside the surface outside of our surface will be assigned zero and that's going to be done automatically by the field component. And then for the inside one, we actually want to do an aggregation that starts from the center, that is the point that is the farthest away from the surface, and slowly grows to fill the volume and get towards the surface. So we're not going to add anything here, but we're going to leave it to the default that is 0 and 1. So now that we've done this, we're going to go to the aggregation tab of WASP and get a WASP field. We could give, him, give it a name, but in this case it's not really important, so we could just leave it as it is. We're going to need to provide our empty field that comes from the field point component. And we're then going to have to provide our values. It's going to take a little bit. And now we created our field. And if we hide whatever we created before, 
what we can go on and do is we can go on and get uh, the construct field component where if you see we can extract all our points again but now here we have the values that have been assigned and what we can do is we can do what we've done with the vertices of the mesh so we can use a gradient to display how this looks like so we're gonna create a gradient component and I'm gonna create a, um, choose a preset that shows quite a bit of difference so for example this one I'm gonna connect my values to T and then I'm gonna use a custom preview component where I'm gonna connect my points and my values here and so you'll see that what we've done so effectively all our points that are outside are green which means that they are all set at zero and then when we look inside our geometry we see that the center has higher values and then as we go outwards the values will slowly lower as we get closer to the surface so that's what we wanted so we can just hide this one for now and so now that we created our field what we need to do is we need to change the algorithm that is used that here it's a stochastic aggregation and replace it with a field driven aggregation that will be able to grow the aggregation according to this field so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep alt pressed and create a bit of space here and I'm then going to go to the aggregation tab and get a field driven aggregation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, by keeping control and shift pressed, I'm going to just move all the inputs of this one to the inputs of that one. So I'm going to move the rules and I'm going to move my reset button. And then I'm going to also move the output. So I'm going to move all the part out of the part out of this one. I can then delete the aggregation and delete the group too. And I now have my field driven aggregation, which of course does not work at the moment because we did not provide a field to work with. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our field, connect it to the field input, and it's gonna take a little bit of time because we are computing the whole thing. But then whenever we're going to press the reset button, we'll see that we are creating an aggregation that effectively starts from the center of our geometry. And we can visualize our geometry again and slowly grows outwards. Now, if we go on and increase the number of parts, we are going to notice one thing. What we're going to be noticing is that, first of all, it's that it's going to take a little bit of time because we are recomputing the whole mesh as well. But what we're going to notice is also that some of the geometries start coming out from our field. And that's because this will try to fill this geometry as much as possible, but at some point it's just not going to be able to place any geometry anymore. And so it's going to start going outwards. So if we want to avoid that, we can use something that, that is called a mesh constraint. And so we can find that if we go to aggregation and get a mesh constraint, we're gonna connect our geometry, so the geometry of our structure to the geometry input. And then we wanna specify that using a toggle, we want the growth to be just inside. So we're gonna turn the toggle to true. And second, we don't want this to be a soft constraint. We want it to be a hard constraint. And what it means is that if we would be using a soft constraint, it's, it would not check the geometry of the whole part, but exclusively the, the position of the centroid of the part, whether it's inside of the mesh. If we set, set the constraint to, uh, to hard, so when we set toggle to false, we make sure that we, the algorithm will also check that the mesh does not intersect with the geometry. So we're then gonna take our GC here and plug it in the GC input of our aggregation. And I mean, now the whole thing will get a bit slower. But you'll see that by default, the constraints will not be computed. And the reason for that is that we have to activate the aggregation mode where the constraints are checked. And to do that, we have to set the mode of the aggregation, which by default is set to zero, which 
means no constraints are considered and we have to set it to two so that the global constraints like our mesh constraint in the case is considered. If these things sound a little bit confusing or not entirely clear, I'm going to give you some links to um, the WASP 101 tutorial series where you can see how constraints are used. And so we're going to create a slider set to 2 and plug it into the mode input. Wait a second, as the, the aggregation is anyway computing. And if we now press reset, You'll notice that now our aggregation, first of all, our aggregation will stop before reaching 400 because it's just not possible for it to grow any further. But you'll see that now it's really fully contained into our geometry. Great. So now we have full control of our geometry. What we can do next is we can also make sure that instead of our whole geometry scaling based on some random point that we are setting in this case here, we could use the surface of our geometry as the attractor that would determine the scaling. So as soon as we get really close to the geometry, our parts will get really small or really big, as going as we want, and then we get closer to the center, it's going to be inverted. To do that, we have to do a couple of changes. So what we're going to be doing is, first of all, we're going to go in our geometry here and what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to change our distance component here with a component that will compute the distance not from this point that we set but from the geometry we have. So what we're going to be doing is I'm going to first of all create another geometry component which is going to be connected to my original geometry and I'm going to then move it up here and I'm going to then again right click and hide the wire so that I have things a little bit clean and then I'm gonna go on and delete my group here and so what I'm gonna go on and simply do is I'm gonna create a pull point component which I'm gonna connect to my center coming from the attribute here and instead of connecting it to the tractor point, I'm going to connect it to my geometry. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to keep Control shift plus and remove the outputs of distance and plug them in the D output of my pull point. I can then delete my distance component. And I'll then do the same by creating for the outer faces. And I'm going to do that by creating a pull point component again. I'm going to connect the output of my polygon center to the P and my geometry again to the G. And then I'm going to once again, keeping control shift pressed, remove the outputs of distance and plug them to the D output of my pull point. I'm going to then delete this and I'm going to just hide everything now. And now you see that what effectively is happening is that I have very small geometries happening at the center of my aggregation. And these geometries are scaling and becoming very big as I get close to the surface. If I would want to invert that, I could simply go to my sliders here and I could change that to point, for example, sorry, say point one for the start and I could say point eight for the end and what you see it's gonna happen is that I'm gonna be controlling and creating geometries that have very larger elements at the end at the end at the center and then this this components gradually start scaling oops I think I broke something. Oh yeah, of course. So this should never reach one, otherwise the geometry will be corrupted. So there's always has to be a little bit of a gap. But you see that we are creating now this geometry that has a certain level of symmetry because of the control shape. However, it's irregular at the different parts. 
and its geometry is controlled by the way it grows as well as the scaling. So we can then go on, change this to Arctic mode and kind of take a look at it and like do screenshots and if you want you can always render this and so on. And so this is it for this uh, organic modeling tutorial using WASP. So of course you can imagine that the same you pattern that we've been using with the hexagonal prism in the first two tutorials and with the triangular elements can be applied to a variety of other geometries also much more complex. You just have to pay a little bit of attention in the way in which you create your geometries and then the way in which you create your attributes and how you manipulate them. But it should be possible to create very complex organic looking geometries by quickly combining the the power of WASP to generate combinatorial structure with the ability of Weber Bird to modify the topology of meshes. So I hope you enjoyed this series. This is the last of the, let's say, regular tutorials. I'm currently planning on making one, two more tutorials in which I'm going to show you how using Rhino 7 and how using the uh, beta version of WASP you can actually simplify some of the processes that we've been doing as well as add more control and increase performance and I'm probably going to release these tutorials in one two weeks time uh, for now I hope you enjoyed the series let me know what you think in the comments if you would want to see more of this short compact series in the future or if you prefer the very long series that I've been doing uh, before and thanks again for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, share your images on Instagram and tag them with GHWASP. And I'm going to see you in the future tutorials. Bye.